Okay, so um, I want to welcome the panelists for the first of our two post-war area literature group panel sessions for the 2021 ALA. We are very sorry that we can't all be together in Boston this year, but it just turned out to be logistically feasible that the panelists come together over Zoom and record uh, our two sessions. So we have a couple of uh, great sessions that we are going to be doing uh, consecutively for the um, tuning in once the actual conference starts. And I will be chairing uh, session one. I'm Jacqueline Furch, and I am professor of English at the University of North Texas. And our first panel for this year's uh, ALA is Climate and the Post-War Poem. So uh, I think I will introduce all three speakers uh, in one group here, and then when each speaker begins, if uh, we would all just announce our paper topic, and then, uh, or any other uh, biographical background we care to share, and then we'll just go from there. And then when everybody has presented, we will uh, hopefully use each other for the Q&A, uh, whoever is not speaking, and of course, even our fellow panelists can ask us questions about our presentations. Okay, so first we will hear from Yuki Tanaka, who is Associate Prof uh, Assistant Professor at uh, Hosai University in Tokyo. And uh, we will then hear from, hopping back and forth here, Baron Haber, who has finished his degree in December from UCSD and has been coordinator of environmental humanities uh, mission at that school and will likely be lecturing at UCSD in the fall. His work is in global Anglophone and South Asian literature. And finally, Florian Gallo will uh, is assistant professor of English at Austin Pay in Tennessee, and is currently at work on a book of book project of post-war American poetry and political cliches. Thank you, Yuki. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. I'm going to share my uh, PowerPoint slides now. Can, can everyone see this? I think I should make it full screen. Okay, um, so this is a working title from a year ago. So my interests have shifted a little, but uh, if you could give me suggestions later, that would be great. Um, okay, I'm gonna start. Um, English poetry has a rich tradition of self-elegy. For example, Dickinson wrote about her imagined death in a poem like, I heard a fly buzz when I died. Yeats in the tower imagines himself writing his will and recording his last words. James Merrill's Christmas tree falls within this tradition. Uh, I'm gonna show that poem first. In 1986, he was diagnosed with HIV and died in 1995, and the poem was written during his final year. In the poem, Merrill compares his withering body to a Christmas tree cut in half and about to be dismantled. One function of self-elegy like these is to memorialize oneself to be remembered for later generations. When, but when we look at Merrill's drafts of Christmas tree, we notice the status of self changes over the course of the revision process. In the earlier drafts, it is not the speaker himself dying, but someone else standing in for him. But when, he, when, when Merrill writes in a later draft, his autobiographical self into the poem with a first person pronoun. The speaker's presence becomes less and less, less pronounced. As soon as Merrill writes directly about his own imminent death, he starts to shift his focus away from the speaker's death to bigger pictures, including the presence of the earth and the presence of other people around him. And what I would like to follow in this paper is to such making and a, a making of self in Merrill's self elegy. And first, I would like to read the, the whole poem since the paper is a close reading of this single poem, and then go into more details about his uh, revision process. To be brought down at last from the cold sign mountain, where I and the others had been fed, looked after, kept still, meant, I knew, of course, I knew that it would be only a matter of weeks that there was nothing more to do. Warmly, they took me in made much of me. The point from the start was to keep my spirits up. I could ascend to that, 
for honestly, it did help to be wound in jewels, to send their colors flashing forth from vents in the deep, fragrant sables that cloaked me head to foot. Over me then they wove a spell of shining, purple and silver chains, eavesdripping tinsel, amulets, milagros, software of silver, a heart, a little girl, a model T, two staring eyes, the angels, trumpets, bud and bee, the children's names in clown-like capitals, somewhere a music box whose tiny song played and replayed I ended before long by loving, and in shadow behind me, a primitive ivy to keep the show going. Yes, yes, what lay ahead was clear, the stripping, the cold street, my chemicals plowed back into the earth for lives to come. No doubt a blessing, a harvest, but one that doesn't bear, now or ever, dwelling upon, to have grown so thin, needles and bone, the little boy's hands meeting about my spine, the mother's voice holding up wonderfully, no dread, no bitterness, the end beginning, today's dusk room aglow for the last time with candlelight, faces love lit, gifts underfoot, still to be so poised, so receptive, still to recall, to praise. In the first conception of the poem, Christmas tree wasn't directly about the poet's own death. Their earliest draft of the poem archived at the Washington University in St. Louis describes the tree as she rather than I uh, in, the final, in the final version. Uh, I'm gonna just read a bit uh, from the earliest draft. To be brought down at last from the cold sign mountain where she had been looked after, fed, kept still, meant that she knew that only a few weeks, two or three remained, that there was nothing more to do. We took her in, made much of her. The point was to keep her spirits up. She lent herself to that as if it honestly helped to be wound in jewels. In this earliest version of the poem, the speaker exists as an observer. The tree is personified as female and he's part of a collective bystanders, we trying to comfort her before she's dismantled. Some of Merrill's phrases suggest such distance between the speaker and the dying tree, did she knew, and as if suggest that the speaker is not identifying with the tree yet. He wonders what she's thinking, which means he's looking at death from outside. Another difference between the draft and the final version is that the draft focuses on an individual. The closing lines of the first draft so emphasize the dying words of she, um, so radiant, as if to say, try, dear ones, to remember me this way. So as if suggesting that the speaker is imagining what she, she would say in her final moment. Wanting to be remembered is a typical wish of the dying. And think, think of the, the ghost of Hamlet saying, of Hamlet's father saying, remember me in, the, in Hamlet. In other words, the draft focuses on preserving the memory of an individual. Over the course of the revision process, Merrill writes himself into the poem. She is replaced by, um, in the fifth draft, uh, I, to be brought down at last from the cold sign mountain where I had been looked after, fed, kept still, now describing himself, his illness, the fact that he is being taken care of by others. By reading himself into the tree, the final speaker is closer to his experience of death, the shift from did she knew to of course I knew emphasizes his certainty about his own death. The overall tone of the final version is that of resignation, acceptance, as he says he feels no dread, no bitterness about his own death. But as soon as I enters the poem, a new note emerges. The poem now goes beyond the death of an individual, but contextualizes it in a larger picture in two main ways. First, Merrill acknowledges the sociality of his own death. In the sixth draft, um, I becomes I and the others as in the final version. Rather than simply replacing she with I, Merrill acknowledges the presence of others, perhaps those friends who have passed away before him, such as David Colston, who had also contracted HIV and died 
nine years before Merrill. Whoever he had in mind, the self is not dying alone on this cold sign mountain. Diana Fuss in her book on elegy suggests that A's poetry restores restore the old tradition of deathbed poems where there are others standing by the bedside watching their friend die. The social aspect of A's related death, how friends one used to know die and the awareness that perhaps the virus had been passed on by friends is implicit in the final version. The presence of others at the speaker's deathbed is also emphasized by another revision. The initial drafts refer to nameless voices comforting the speaker, bearing up wonderfully voices breathed. But in the final draft, it is the mother's voice. There is also a reference to a little boy in the poem um, in the final version. Perhaps Merrill is remembering himself when he was little. Father is absent from this poem, which reminds readers of Merrill's own broken home. Second, not only the final poem acknowledge the presence of others, the speaker's death is now in the context of a larger ecological world. He sees his death as part of a natural cycle. My chemicals plowed back into the earth for lives to come. Interestingly, in the fifth draft, the line is more hopeful, plowed back to enrich the ground for lives to come, but Merrill takes out and reach the ground, casting uncertainty over how much his death contributes to the future. This tenuous link between the speaker and the future might come from Merrill's uneasiness with not leaving children behind for his memory to be carried on. In an early poem called Childlessness, Merrill writes, but in my garden, nothing is planted. On a related note in Christmas tree, I think there's a pun on the word bear. No doubt a blessing, a harvest, but one that doesn't bear, now or ever dwelling upon. One sense of the word bear is the speaker can't bear or stand thinking about his own death, but the link, a line break at bear, the little pause in the context of harvest, evokes another meaning of bear, as in fruit bearing or child bearing, something the speaker could not do. There is a future and he's not part of it and he accepts the fact. Unlike the first draft where the tree and she wants to be remembered, to be memorialized, the final version effaces the speaker completely toward the end, grammatically. Um, the last lines are all fragments with no mention of the first person pronoun, still to be so poised, so receptive, still to recall, to praise. The infinitives point toward the future to come where recalling and praising will happen, but it is unclear whether he is the one doing all the recalling and praising. A Christmas tree is a self-elegy, but instead of memorializing himself with his last words, Merrill imagines a future that goes on without him. The fact that he uses she in the first draft suggests that he's trying to distance himself from his own death. But once he writes himself into the poem, it is as though the reality of his imminent death became so great that he couldn't imagine anything but his own disappearance. Merrill is often praised for his autobiographical style that he always writes about his life, his family, his lovers, but uh, in one of his last poems, he comes to accept a world without self. Uh, thank you. <laughs> that was wonderful. Uh, I guess I should probably take over. Thank you so much, Yuki. Uh, I was I was really captured by that. I'd never read that poem before, and it's, it's I mean, it nearly brought tears to my eyes. It's such a beautiful poem. <laughs> just kind of thinking about it. Um, yeah, so thanks, Yuki. Um, okay, hi, I'm Baron. Uh, I'll go ahead and share screen now. Let's see if I can do this. You guys getting that? What do you guys see? Do you guys just see the... It looks like the uh, PowerPoint is in the, the kind of not quite presentation mode where we can see all the slides. Yeah, the yep, yep. Let me do it as, I want it to be presenter view. No, you guys can still see everything terribly, can't you? Yeah. 
Full screen. Try this. No. I'm seeing the um uh the web browser. Oh, cool. now 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 the PowerPoint's up. Yeah, looks great. Okay, let me do. Ah, sorry. You know I'm just gonna do this. How's that? Great. Sorry about that. Hi. Um, so I'm Baron Haber. I'm a uh, uh, just got my degree from UCSB in December. Um, so, and I'm going to be um, right now. I'm an independent scholar, um, but um, I will be presenting today on almost two tool as the palm wine drinker. My presentation title, um, similar to Yuki's, was. Uh, something I wrote before the pandemic. So I think this is still sort of what I'm doing, but uh, also um, forgive me for maybe straying a little bit from the initial intentions. So um, I'm aware that I'm a little bit of a fish out of water here presenting on a Nigerian author, um, Thomas Tutola at a Conference of American Literature. But I do think that this paper fits with this panel and this conference because my initial point of concern is with the circulation of African literature in the US and other Western literary markets. The way that publishers and critics shape a particular picture of Africa, of Nigeria, and really of the African author as kind of an object. Um, at the time of this uh, novel's publication in 1952 in the UK and then 1953 in the US, Tutuola's novel and Tutuola himself was packaged for US in European readerships as an archeological object, a journey back to the origins of humanity itself. Um, in this presentation, I wanna pay close attention to actually the text of the novel. Um, the way Tutuola's hybrid discourse in his representations of fantastical economies, far from providing a kind of picture of an untouched past, um, actually provides a subtle aesthetic performance that modulates between myth and a kind of proto-magical realism. And in this way, the novel's epi episodes grapple with Nigeria's difficult place in the post-war global order. And its language enacts the violence of a long, traumatic, and ongoing history of extractive capitalism. Um, two types of extraction, the extraction of oil and the extraction of what will be, become known as African culture play a key role in Nigeria's emergence as an independent nation state, as well as, as, well as its integration into post-war neocolonial networks. Their connections, both metaphorical and material between these two objects of extraction, between literature and oil. On the metaphorical level, like oil, um, Nigerian novels by authors such as Tutuola were sold to Western audiences as commodities, transmuted over millennia within the dark spaces of the earth, brought from parts unknown to domestic shores by the machinery of transnational corporations. For example, consider some of the early reviews of Tutuola's novel after its publication, US publication in 1953. You might let me do this. <laughs> Gosh, I'm sorry. Don't know why this is doing it. We'll just do it this way. Um, Sorry. Here we go. <clears throat> he's the so you can see some of this language as he's described his his writing, right? He's a true primitive. Um, he produced, you know, naive poetry. Mr. Tutola is a natural storyteller. Um, let me go ahead and um, you know, one catches one catches the glimpse of the very beginning of literature. The moment when writing at last seizes and pins down the myths and legends of an analphabetic culture. You can see already the kind of obvious primitivism of all of this, all of this language here, right? I mean, the explicitly primitivism in terms of um, calling him a true primitive, but really seeing African culture as simply an earlier version of US and Western culture, right? This is kind of where we came from, what have we what we have uh, matured beyond in certain ways. Um, I also want to say that, um, you know, Tutuola, 
uh, Tuttle himself, you know, articulated the primary goal in writing the novel to be recuperative, to inspire a generation that he saw leading, uh, leaving the Yoruba customs as they turned towards European things. His commentary on his own craft often reveal an auto-anthropological instinct, a desire to preserve traditional local culture he saw disappearing before his eyes. But despite his stated intentions, the myths that he relates in the Palm White Drinkard bear the scars of colonialism in their plots, symbols, and languages. These tales suggest numerous and obvious allegorical readings. It is not difficult to find historical and contemporary real historical and contemporary real world analogs for the novel's various characters and events. This is by no means pure legend. These stories are not simply translated from Yoruba to English. They are translated across multiple temporalities, geographic borders, and ontological frameworks. It is precisely the friction between legend and history that generates this haunting aesthetic and the political potential of Tutuola's work. Its ability to exist in the interstices between the local and the global, between the untime of myth and the relentless linear time of the novel. These moments of hybrid discourse puncture merely anthropological evaluations of the texts, thereby returning the gaze of the global other. In this way, the novel can be seen as innovating an anti-colonial aesthetic, despite perhaps the will of its author. And one of the main flanks of this novel's assault on colonial culture is the problem of extractive economies. The condensation of, Nigeria, of the Nigerian nation state as a geopolitical unit is a product of several phases of extractive capitalism, from the slave trade of the 17th and 18th century to the export of palm oil and other cash crops during colonization, to the present day extraction of oil from the Niger River Delta, um, which began uh, just after the post-war era, um, or just the beginning of the post-war era, oil was discovered in Nigeria in 1950, and there were the first export of oil was in 1957. Um, these economic relations have shaped Nigeria according to global demands. The cultural extraction, uh, extraction of Nigeria should be seen in relation to these other extractive networks. And these are material connections often. For example, Nigerian liquefied gas, which is a joint venture between the Nigerian government and other multinational oil corporations, actually furnishes the cash award for the Nigerian Literature Prize. So this lit washing, as Jennifer Wenzel has called it, shows how idealist notions of cultural exchange can paper over a political economy of domination and environmental catastrophe. The myth of how the novel was produced, written by hand over two days, a kind of automatic writing that seemed to require no artifice or critical capacity on Tutuola's part, is a double-edged sword with regards to the author's legacy. On one hand, his ride to prominence was fueled by this image of him as a natural genius, a characterization of the author in novel that allowed Western consumers to enjoy the fantasy they were consuming something raw or extending the oil metaphor, crude or unrefined. On the other hand, this obviously racist and primitivist framework for evaluation assumes an ambidirectional, fundamentally extractive model of transnational literary circulation. Despite the fact that Tutuola was raised Christian, educated in the England's Anglican school, and served as a mechanic for the Royal Air Force during World War II, the representation of Tutuola by his publishers was of an author untouched by and therefore unable to comment upon Western modernity. It's worth noting that Tutuola's international popularity was not shared domestically at the time of publication. Um, let me go ahead and... Um, as you can see from this quote, um, many West Africans felt like, uh, you know, it is a bad attempt at an African narrative in good English. Um, the language in which is written to West Africans and all English uh, is foreign to West Africans in, in English people for, or for anybody for that matter. So depending on what direction we choose to look from, there are two different pictures of Tutuola that emerged at the time of publication. Of, of the palm wine drinker. From the West, the picture of a naive innocent providing glimpses of mankind's beginnings. From Nigeria, of a profiteer hawking hack versions of legends that belong rightly to the Yoruba people, extracting money and fame from his birthright. Both of these readings assume problematically, I would say, 
that African literature and Nigerian literature is first and foremost, and first and foremost, an anthropological object, an object through which Africa, Africans and Nigeria and Nigerians can be bottled and distributed, either domestically or internationally. I wanna suggest that the novel is actually doing something much more canny and complex than simply bottling the past for its Western readership. To understand this dimension of the novel, I wanna engage with moments where it speaks not from the authentic space of oral tradition, but rather from a hybrid consciously artificial and incomplete space, the space Homi Baba has taught us of post-colonial discourse. While the novel appears to deliver a hero's quest epic narrative after, out of Af African folklore and legend, the novel frequently employs hybrid discourse to repeatedly stage clashes between opposing ontological systems. These weird moments of dissonance where the, comics, where the cosmic stage of myth is suddenly reduced to the cold finitude of economic bureaucracy and bookkeeping disturb primitivist readings as the novel no longer appears to be something out of archeological time, but rather an object engaged with contemporary global political issues. A novel that has something to say about the place of Nigeria within the emergent global order. This discursive hybridity can be found in nearly every episode of Tutuola's epic structure. And for the rest of the presentation, I will focus on three episodes from early on in the novel, each of which represents a different economic structure. First, a traditional or ancestral economy, then a wartime or slave economy, and third, a money economy. In each of these episodes, Tutuola's plot and language stages the clash between local traditions and global influence presenting a picture not of a holistic and coherent culture, but of one already coming apart and transforming under these pressures. All right, I'm just gonna do it from here. Um, consider first the, the novel's opening, describing the drunkard, uh, the drinkard at the beginning of his journey before the death of his tapster compels him to go on a quest to fetch his servant from dead town. And this is this first quote. Um, I was a palm wine drinker since I was a boy the age of ten years. Uh, since I was a boy of ten years of age, I had no other work more than to drink palm wine in my life. In those days, we did not know other money except calories, so that everything was very cheap. And my father was the richest man in town. On one hand, this seems to be presenting a picture of untouched local traditions, but note how immediately this culture is seen retrospectively through a pastoral lens that sees traditional bonds and economies in comparison to that which will come after, work and money. Also, the calculations of this traditional economy, as you can see from this quote, are both absurdly large and general, broad, you know, square, right? Um, we have uh, his father or this tapster draws from this plot of land where it's nine miles square with 560,000 palm trees. Um, he has this, uh, you know, absurd, absurdly large appetite for palm wine, where he's drinking 150 kegs every morning, right? So it's these, these larger than life, very round numbers are being shown up in front of it. And these numbers are then compared by the friends he's gathering from this economy, um, friends that are uncountable. So um, a quick mapping of this economy, I, I've mapped these out, thinking about, you know, the consumer is the drinkard, the laborer is the tapster, the means of production is the father's lands and trees. Um, the, the tapster is kind of compelled by this tradition and social structure of the village. It's his job because this is always the job because uh, the drinker's father tells him. And then you have the surplus value, value of friends and entertainment, these kind of, this kind of social conviviality that's being generated um, by this ancestral economy. Um, Jennifer Wenzel, describes this economy as a closed circuit, a circulation of capital that produces only this kind of social sur surplus. Throughout his life, Tutuola witnesses the strain put on these traditional economies by, by global incorporation. Um, during the first part of the 20th century, 2,000 calories, which would be a considerable sum um, in the Yoruba communities, was the equivalent of about six pence um, in British currency. Um, so the, the ancestral culture and economy is from the very beginning framed as doomed, framed as already lost. Um, the second economic organization 
that I want to discuss today um, that it enacts comes from this episode of The Half-Body Baby. And this is a rather horrific episode of the novel. Um, basically, the tapster's wife bears this, what's called a half-body baby, out of her thumb on her left hand. Um, and the baby's possessed of this supernatural, unquenchable appetite. It eats entire villages out of house and home, um, terrorizing the populace with whips, killing their livestock, smashing everything to bits. In order to kill this terrible offspring, the tapster burns down the house where the baby is sleeping, only have, have the baby re return from the ash. And this is the quote I have here. Um, he was talking with a lower voice, like a telephone. This word telephone really stands out. Um, it's another one of those eruptive moments of disjointed translation, where an object out of modernity shatters the illusion of myth. This no longer seems to be a holistic and original legend, but rather a bricolage that is drawing omnivorously from a variety of discourses, objects, traditions. And once again, it's easy to find both historical and contemporary analogs for the half-bodied baby episode, following the direction suggested by the telephone. Um, this speaks to the ravages of slavery with references to flogging, and also to fear of this ravenous rising generation, that same generation that uh, Tutuola had bemoaned as letting Yoruba tradition die of neglect. So even though this is supposed to be a traditional story, it's clearly making comments partly through these this moments of hybridity um, on the current situation in Nigeria and Nigeria in, within the global order. Um, so one final uh, kind of economic organization I want to discuss, and this is almost a direct opposite of that ancestral economy I described for the novel's opening. Um, and it is an economy based around labor, the extraction of natural resources and money. Um, the episode occurs almost immediately after the tapster and his wife are able to escape the half-bodied baby. Um, they're destitute, they're starving, and, but they discover a really resourceful method of gathering funds. So, um, so the drinker, you know, he has these magical juju. Um, these are things that are given to him by his father that give him kind of magical transformative capacities. So what he does is he cuts down a tree and he carves it into a paddle and then he transforms himself into a canoe. Um, and then he uses his magical juju, um, you know, to transform himself and then has his wife paddle him back, paddle, travelers back and forth, ferry them across the river all day. And he's, we're told at the end of this that the money he gets from it is 56 pounds, 11 sterling, and nine pence. Um, think about how this stands in comparison to some of the numbers of this economy or, or just the way this economy worked, right? We have these gigantic numbers, 56,000 palm trees. Here we have this very, very exact and quite meager numbers. Um, this is exactly what I mean by Tutuola's hybrid discourse, where these opposing scales, these opposing genres, these opposing ontological visions are smashed together with little suturing. Um, we have all these kind of happening simultaneously in the same world. The aesthetic scars of the novel running along these fault lines can and should be right alongside the disruptions of local Yoruba life because of processes like colonization and the emergence of Nigeria as a geopolitical unit. My point in looking at these um, representations of economy is to show how the novel, itself an object extracted by Nigeria from, from, um, by corporations for profit, is actively engaged with critical allegorical responses to these extractive economies. Um, I hope this presentation provides thinking about the relation, uh, provokes thinking about the relationship between circulation and extraction of literature and other cultural goods um, and against the circulation and extraction of natural and human capital. These are important questions as Nigerian literature gains more transnational popularity, while at the same time, Nigeria is undergoing extreme ecosystemic and social collapse, in large part because of um, the disaster of oil in the Niger River Delta. We must not see literature as a clean version of commerce. It's all fermenting together, waiting to be tapped. Thank you. Great. Really great. Yeah, sorry about the sorry about the weirdness with PowerPoint. I don't understand these things sometimes. Great. Yeah.
Hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen for the PowerPoint. OK, is that showing up properly? OK, great. Um, so I'll be talking today about the bomb in the post-war poem. After the United States detonated a nuclear bomb over Hiroshima and then Nagasaki in August 1945, the photographs of clouds rising above the two cities soon became defining images of the atomic age. These pictures, reproduced in newspapers, magazines, books, television programs, and political posters, were said to encapsulate the existential threat posed by nuclear weapons. But how could such images, which were often termed indescribable, be put into words? Poets who wished to confront the impact of nuclear warfare faced a significant problem, for public discourse was riddled with stock phrases that glossed over or willfully concealed the bomb's consequences. To adequately confront the nuclear age then, poets would need to avoid the phrases that were most readily available in public discourse and create alternative metaphors that try to speak more responsibly to their historical moment. This challenge has gone largely undiscussed. Scholars of post-war literature, such as Edward Brunner, Mark Morrison, and Adam Beardsworth, have usefully identified poems that evoke the atom bomb implicitly. What has received less attention is how poets design metaphors to counter phrases about nuclear weapons that were already in circulation. By creating alternative images, poets were able to indirectly critique existing phrases and point to their limits. First, we should consider what stock images were most commonly used in public discourse to describe the atom bomb. William Lawrence, the only journalist invited to the nuclear test Trinity in 1945 for the New York Times, struggled to find the right words for what he saw and ran through several possibilities. He compared the launch to a meteor coming from the earth instead of from outer space and a living totem pole carved with many grotesque masks grimacing at the earth. Later commentators, as noted by the historian Spencer Wirt, described the explosion as a geyser, a great funnel, a cauliflower, a raspberry, and a convoluting brain. Yet the phrase that stuck in the popular imagination more than any other was mushroom. Lawrence had made use of this image himself in his article for the New York Times, quote, as the mushroom floated off into the blue, it changed its shape into a flower-like form, its giant petal curving downward, creamy white outside, rose-colored inside. In the years that followed, this phrase became the preferred metaphor for describing the cloud produced by nuclear explosion. The London Times announcing the attack on Nagasaki described a huge mushroom of smoke and dust. And as early as 1947, a report by the US Joint Task Force One referred to the mushroom as the common symbol of the atomic age. Granted, there are reasons why the mushroom may have felt like a suitable image. Robert Wasson wrote in 1957 of its association with dark places, poison and death, and paradoxically with ever expanding sprawl. More recently, Tara McDowell has argued that the mushroom captured another contradiction, quote, of the iconic and the incomprehensible, of absurdity and sheer horror. The difference in scale is relevant as well, for the smallness of the mushroom could evoke the vastness of the cloud by contrast. But the image also has obvious limitations. First, it disguises what is in fact an assault on the environment by reframing the bomb itself as an organic phenomenon. Second, by focusing on the cloud itself, the image evades the reality of what follows a nuclear attack. Both of these issues are already present in Lawrence's sentence about the mushroom assuming a flower-like form, its giant petal curving downward, creamy white outside, rose-colored inside. Here, the cloud is conceived as a natural occurrence, the bomb flowering into its fullest final shape, oddly beautiful and graceful. What comes after the explosion remains beyond the scope of Lawrence's description. And indeed, the emphasis on the cloud's beauty distracts from its aftermath. Poets who saw alternative to such images recognize that a phrase like mushroom cloud conceals the reality of nuclear warfare and its human, ethical, and environmental impact. They also saw how these images suppress the uncertainty that the bomb created for the planet's future. But how could poetry invent metaphors that capture not only the visual properties of nuclear attacks, but also their repercussions? 
To show the variety of responses that this problem generated in post-war poetry, I have selected three examples with different degrees of critical recognition. Indeed, alternative images appear in the work of some of the most canonical authors of the era, like John Berriman, as well as poets that have not been so widely discussed. Uh, my first example is a 1946 poem by Irene Orgel titled Sonnet to Lise Meitner, dedicated to the Austrian-Swedish physicist whose research contributed to the discovery of nuclear fission. Orgel creates a string of images that stress the uncertain future of the atomic age, shifting our focus from the cloud itself to its under, un, undefined aftermath. She is the one who saw a world dissolve. Folks are as scattered leaves before a storm. Seeds shuffle and the nations intermix. And being such a one, equipped to solve the riddle, find the answer, grasp the form, perhaps the path of wandering planets fix. What has she seen? The embryonic brain looks up bewildered at the egg blue sky and prays the hour of birth is not yet nigh or wishes it were unconceived again. What has she seen? And can she ever tell, we call on men of science to explain, whether the cracking of the fragile shell will free us into heaven or to hell? The poem runs through a pattern of related images, embryo, egg, and shell. By referring to the human brain as embryonic, Orgel suggests that human societies are ill-equipped to foresee and understand the consequences of this scientific discovery. At the same time, the transition from embryonic brain to egg and shell creates a direct line from humanity to first the environment via the egg blue sky, and then the consequences of nuclear testing and warfare with the cracking of the fragile shell. But what does the fragile shell refer to literally? Much of the impact of this phrase comes from its multiplicity. It could serve as a metaphor for the bomb that has cracked or exploded. It could also be a description of the earth whose surface has traditionally been imagined as a shell. It could also refer back to the sky so that the egg blue firmament evoked in line eight is broken by the poem's end. Most likely it refers to all three so that the cracking of the fragile shell illustrates the ever widening circles of the bomb's destruction from the weapon to its immediate surroundings to the Earth's surface and finally the sky. Orgel's pattern of images can thus be said to represent dynamically the expanding scope of the atomic bomb's impact. Another notable feature of the fragile shell image is that it offers an alternative to the implications of the mushroom cloud. As I mentioned before, the mushroom not only evoked growth but also presented the cloud as the final product of that growth erasing the, the bomb's grim aftermath, which would only become evident once the smoke had cleared. A cracked shell, by contrast, emphasizes an unknown future, since it stresses the uncertainty of what the bomb will leave in its wake, what creature or chaos, or in the words of the poet, what heaven or hell. Indeed, it is fitting that the poem ends with a question. That too is a bit of self-conscious play this time on the sonnet form. Traditionally, sonnets introduce a problem in the opening octave and then provide a solution in the closing sestet. Orgel sonnet, however, begins and ends with a question. This matters especially since the detonation over Hiroshima and Nagasaki was repeatedly framed by public officials as a solution, a way to end the war more quickly. By countering the traditional structure of the sonnet, Orgel argues that from its very creation, the bomb offered not a solution, but an existential question that could not be resolved. Uh, the second poem I wish to discuss, Lynn Emanuel's The Planet Krypton from 1984, dramatizes the failure of descriptive language in the face of nuclear destruction. In it, the speaker overhears the detonation of a bomb test in the Las Vegas desert. From the Las Vegas Tonopah artillery and gunnery range, the sound of the atom bomb came biting like a swarm of bees. We sat in the hot Nevada dark, delighted when the switch was tripped and the bomb hoisted up its silky hooded, glittering, uncoiling length. It hissed and spit, it sizzled like a poker in a toddy. The bomb was no mind and all body. It sent a fire of static down the spine. In the dark, it glowed like the coils of an electric stove. It stripped every leaf from every branch until a willow by a creek was a bouquet of switches, resinous, naked, flexible, and fine. 
The description of the sights and sounds produced by the bomb splinters into a variety of different similes, all taken from the natural or domestic realm. She compares the bomb's bite to a swarm of bees, its hiss to a poker in a toddy, and its glow to the coils of an electric stove. On first look, this trio of images seems to belong to the same thematic world as the mushroom cloud, and its evocation both of the natural world and the kitchen, with all the attendant problems that I mentioned before. But the repetition of the word like reinforces the artificiality of the similes concocted by the poet. Emmanuel stresses their inadequacy further with her choice of verbs. After all, bombs do not bite, hiss, spit, or sizzle, and glow is far too muted a word to convey the blinding light of an atomic bomb. To counter these evasive metaphors, Emmanuel then turns her attention away from the bomb to a willow devastated by the explosion, here presented as an emblem of the environmental disaster caused by the bomb. She compares the tree to a bouquet of switches, resinous, naked, flexible, and fine. While the word bouquet keeps us in the evasive realm of nature imagery, with its evocation of flowers, the bouquet's contents pull us quickly back into the realm of modern technology that has produced the nuclear bomb, with switches resinous, naked, flexible, and fine. The shift from the natural to the technological reproduces in miniature the linguistic shift that Emmanuel thinks we must undertake conceptually to fully reckon with the environmental impact of nuclear weapons and our role in that destruction. The wires may still be metaphorical in this instance, but they no longer exempt humans from responsibility. Rather, th rather than naturalizing the bomb and its effects, this image ties the bomb's destruction to its human technological origins. In the final stanza, Emmanuel retreats back to domestic similes to remind us of the risk posed by evasion. A new planet bloomed above us. In its light stump, in, in its light, I'm sorry, the stumps of cut pine gleamed like dinner plates. The world was beginning all over again, fresh and hot. We could have anything we wanted. In the poem's final moments, the speaker adopts a credulous perspective, reframing destruction as regeneration. The atomic cloud is no longer a symbol of ruin. It becomes instead a new planet. The world we were told was beginning all over again. The speaker's tone has the quality of a sales pitch. The planet is being sold to us fresh and hot like a stack of pancakes. The simile comparing the pine trees to gleaming dinner plates would seem to support this attitude. But the description also subverts it. For the pines here are not in bloom. They have been cut down, leaving mere stumps in their wake. That discrepancy between the literal tree stumps and the claims of rebirth made in the remainder of the image and stanza foregrounds the kinds of deception that language facilitates when explosions are described as mushroom clouds. The first two examples I have discussed so far countered the buried implications of atomic era cliches with a multiplicity of images. Uh, in the last poem I will talk about today much more briefly, uh, titled The Dispossessed, John Berryman creates a single highly unusual metaphor for the atomic bomb, a blooming umbrella, and then nestles it within a jarring context, the conventions of romantic melodrama. That which a captain and a weaponeer one day and one more day did, we did, ah, we did not, they did. Cam slid, the great lock lodged, and no soul of us all was near, was near. A evil sky where the umbrella bloomed, twirled its mustaches, hisses, the ingenue fumed, poor virgin, and no hero rise. Here the bomb's expanding cloud gets reimagined as a blooming umbrella. The verb bloom evokes natural growth, like so many of the images invented to describe the M bomb in this time, not just uh, mushroom, but also raspberry, for example. But the object that follows, an umbrella, quickly yanks us back into the world of human invention. The choice of object also introduces a paradox, since a weapon of mass destruction is being compared to a tool used for protection. This paradox is significant because the atomic bomb itself was routinely framed by military officials as a necessary form of protection. Likewise, the attacks of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were defended on the grounds that they would bring the war to an end and save the lives of American soldiers. That contradiction, a weapon of destruction as the great and only true protection, even when it gets deployed in a nuclear strike, 
was and still is central to political communications around the bomb. By creating a metaphor that plays on this paradox, Berman aims to draw out its absurdity. He achieves this as well by, the, by setting the image of the blooming umbrella within a world of melodramatic cliches, the ingenue, the hero, and the villain with the twirling mustache. But his point here is precisely that the cast has been scrambled beyond recognition. The hero is gone from the scene, leaving the ingenue without rescue, and the villain is so abstract that he has subsumed the sky where his mustache twirls. For Berman, the language of heroism and villainy, so important to military propaganda, can no longer hold water. The use of atomic weaponry by those who would call themselves the heroes of the story makes it impossible to speak simply of heroism. The three poems I discussed today are examples of a broader phenomenon in post-war American poetry, whereby poets attempted to complicate the images used to talk about the atom bomb by inventing alternatives that could offer an indirect critique. To varying degrees, Orgel, Emanuel, and Berryman all push back against the same ideas communicated by phrases like the mushroom cloud. First, they rejected the evasions that disguise nuclear warfare's threat to the environment by framing the bomb itself in the language of nature. Second, they resisted the assumption that the cloud represented the final form of atomic weaponry, an idea reinforced by the widespread reproduction of images showing the cloud rather than its aftermath in the immediate post-war era. Third, they complicated the idea that the bomb provided the ultimate protection, the ultimate response to insecurity, by stressing instead how the discovery of nuclear fission throws us into an uncertain future. The Earth's shell is now cracked, and to side Berriman, no hero arrives. Thank you very much. Those were three terrific papers, and uh, I really um, want to thank each of you for very different, but I think you know each fabulous. Sometimes when I hear a great paper, I'm I just feel drain. <laughs> I feel like I don't have anything else to say to that. That was just so great. I just want to let it sit there. I am thinking of things to to query the panelists with, but I also wonder if uh, anyone else is ready to to query because I certainly don't have to go first. Anybody have any questions for our speakers? I can jump okay. in. Oh, oh, I saw Jennifer raised her hand too. <laughs> Nicole, why don't you go ahead and get us started? Oh, sure. Yeah, my, mine was very, um, not not so much a, it's not, I'm not going to do it, not a question, but a comment thing, but kind of a, a thread I noticed between the three fantastic papers uh, is kind of the importance of framing small moments in really charged political situations, because each of the three uh, contextual backgrounds that you gave were, were just, you know, three of the biggest things happening in, in the post-war period. And I was wondering if anyone um, wanted to either elaborate a little bit on why framing is so important, especially in poetry. Uh, and I know in, in um, the novel you were looking at, Baron, uh, because of how metaphorical it is, it kind of functions in some ways to be read in that poem like manner. But how the framing is so difficult for the poets at the time and what it does for us to look back at their work in this moment and kind of realize how something, I didn't even think about the mushroom cloud metaphor as maybe um, one that, you know, people had to choose because it's become now like a terminology. It's just kind of like mushroom cloud. We all know that. Um, so, so if anyone wanted to, to talk a little more about the, the framing they were thinking of it, I think that'd be wonderful. And thank you again for those papers. Well, I think one way you can approach it, uh, sorry if I interrupted you there, Florian. Um, I mean, one thing that really struck me both in Yuki and Florian's uh, paper, and that made me think about the way this is playing out in my paper a little bit, was this kind of question of kind of self-elegy. I was really compelled by that idea that um, Yuki put forward in his paper. And I think that almost you can look at Florian's paper as kind of like, this is like self-elegy on like this grand cosmic level where it's like like elegy for like humanity and elegy for the planet, whatever, you know? Um, but the sense that like there is this kind of witnessing of loss as it's happening that I'm seeing in both of both the Christmas tree and these kind of amazing uh, war poems. And then we think a little bit about it in um, the way it's working in Tutuola um, in the way that he, you know, 
there's something about reading the the novel itself that it does feel very kind of like maybe it's because of the, kind of the style or the language, but it does feel like it's very kind of edgy and it is kind of engaging. It's all these like there's constantly things like the telephone coming in and like bombs being mentioned and stuff like that. But then when, it's almost when you read Tutuola talking about what he's doing that you get the elegiac language where he's getting like, oh, I'm doing this because I see my tradition being corrupted and like I need, the, I need to preserve this in some way. And reading that stuff in preparation for this panel, I'm like, dude, like that's not actually what your stories are doing. You're not preserved. Like these are very much more hybrid and kind of interesting and modernist and all these, you know, um, so... Uh, but it is, I mean, in a way, I could almost read it as kind of a cultural self elegy and think about the way he's, you know, framing it almost like in his pub, in his publicity more as that. Um, but yeah, I was interested in like kind of what you guys thought about that kind of self-aware, like mourning the self, mourning the loss of self through AIDS or mourning the loss of humanity because of uh, like kind of nuclear destruction. Yeah, what really strikes me in reading, you know, Orgel and Berryman and Emmanuel and other post-war poets is how well-positioned poets were to be this, these sort of critical ears to the language of their time, right? Because as, as we all know, in a poem, every detail matters, right? It matters where a line begins or ends. Very minute shifts in tone matters matter disproportionately within a poem. So when poets are taking up these, you know, ready-made phrases, right, in the public sphere and then reflecting on them and creating these alternatives, they're able to bring that very close critical scrutiny. Um, and I think it matters especially with phrases that would seem like kind of throwaway idioms, like mushroom cloud, right? That's sort of become a stock image. What does it matter if we refer to um, this form of cloud, this form of explosion as a mushroom cloud. And poetry is really well positioned to make us listen again and think a little bit more deeply about the risks that are implicit in public language, especially in the phrases that we use ourselves without really thinking of their implications. No, I had kind of a follow. Oh, go ahead, Yuki, pardon me. Oh, well, I want to hear your answer to Nicole's question in a second. But... <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, I was going in a different I get direction. Oh. Yeah, a bit about the framing question. Um, I was just thinking after the, what Baron said. Um, um, I was thinking about the difference between like a personal loss and the cultural loss, and how cultural loss seems so immediate to people who used to live in that moment, and how it's kind of difficult to retrieve after something happens. For for example, can we write? Can I, can I write a poem about atomic bomb at this moment? I think the immediacy of the the situation back then is so lost. But personal loss is like it's a grief. It's 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 just, it's just recurs over and over, and it's it's more it's be, even becomes more immediate after you after um you um leave that moment behind. So I feel like um you know, the framing in terms of cultural loss is so important to re recover that immediacy a little bit because it's, it's kind of lost, but it's kind of an obvious point, but uh, I was just thinking of this difference between personal and cultural. Sorry, please go ahead. No, I just, you know, on the topic of what you were saying, Florian, that um, back to your introductory remarks about how the photo archive of the bomb, I think related to some of these innocuous terms is of that initial moment, you know, this kind of sublime boom that you don't ever have to uh, think about the aftermath of because of it just being this shot of the initial detonation. So generally, you know, I want, the, and therefore the poems, you know, kind of have a duration that the photo doesn't, that kind of draws us into now what, you know, how are we gonna survive this or what's it gonna feel like after the dust is settled by virtue of it being a literary form as opposed to a photo form. So I just wondered if you had any more to say about the temporality of these poet poems and or, you know, the tension between a photo archive that is nothing but aesthetic and sublime and poetry uh, which is supposed to be capitalizing in those categories and yet probably wants to oppose itself to the beautification of, of atomic war as was uh, captured in those early photographs. 
No, thank you for that. That's that's a very good point because one of the advantages that the the poets have is that they're able to reflect on these phrases, for example, you know, over time, right? So we have these poems, the manual, for example, where she begins with an initial image and then she's able to then complicate that image repeatedly over several lines, right? Whereas a picture can only give us an instant in time. And it's true that photography has also been an important tool in, you know, protesting the bomb as well, right? And protesting nuclear warfare, right? And, you know, photojournalism that's about revealing what is going on in the ground. There's another way in which a photo is also limited, right? By its temporality. So one of the advantages of the poems is their ability to then reflect and complicate a given phrase, for example, um, over time. And I think you're right. There's also a tension in the poems between sort of the, 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 that you know the the way in which the the photo became seen and discussed as sort of a beautiful object in of itself, poets are recoiling from that, but they're also working in an art form that prizes beauty, right? That prizes the well turned phrase, and there's a certain awkwardness I think for them in trying to come up with alternative images that won't then be themselves too neat, too tidy, too beautiful, too aesthetic, which is why I think we have. For example, in, in Emmanuel, these sort of awkward images, right, that reflect on back on the mushroom cloud, but aren't going to be sort of the solution, right, the final, you know, alternative if metaphor to the mushroom cloud. Great. Yeah, and I just wanted to follow up on yours, Florian. Um, I was really intrigued by the way that you were kind of deploying the concept of the natural within your paper. I love that you kind of call it like the elusive realm of the natural, which I think is like always like a, a good way of thinking about that term. Um, that, that, that amazing image of kind of an umbrella blooming, right? Something that is like this unnatural thing that's there to protect against like natural elements, but then it, it itself is kind of turning natural. And thinking about kind of the place of nuclear weapons, nuclear energy within nature. I mean, like the, it really is, I mean, I think that's something in that first poem on, on the, the sonnet, you know, that's really talking about kind of the, where it's talking about like the leaves that become kind of just like scattered, right? I think that's such a beautiful image, but it actually, to kind of bring this a little bit around, it made me think about the actual original metaphor of a mushroom cloud, right? Because mushrooms themselves are like the recyclers, right? They're part of this very, very deep biological process in time, right? Where things are kind of recycled over like thousands of years, right? Um, so there's something almost that that's like, to kind of combine that with kind of like the, like the thinking about the way mushrooms are natural versus the way that like nuclear physics are natural and the way that this kind of happenstance of image, but also that it's kind of making us think, question the, the signifier of nature itself, I think, was kind of interesting and something I, I couldn't help but think about as I was listening to your presentation. I have a question for Yuki, though. I don't want to derail this um, great discussion, but I wanted to ask, um, Yuki, and I'll direct this question to you, but then maybe I'll explain how it can be opened out to all of your presentations. But I was really taken with your discussion of how this poem, um, The Christmas Tree, which I've never read before, and it was so lovely. Thank you for reading it to us. How it, um, you described it as making and unmaking the self, which I just thought was such a fabulous formulation. I'm endlessly curious about poetry because I don't work on poetry. I work on the novel. And in the novel, the ca characters are so like, you know, typically very strong kind of, you know, individualistic. There's this sense of the protagonist as this really defined kind of person. But I'm wondering if poetry as a literary form is particularly well suited perhaps to this challenging of self. And I was wondering if maybe you could speak to maybe this idea of the, the unmaking of self, maybe in relation to, to poetry as like a, a literary form um, and how it is perhaps well suited to that endeavor. Thank you for a great question. <laughs> That's a, I, oh, 
can, can I get can I have more time to think about this? It's such a big yeah, question. But I, well, I haven't I really thought about this. <laughs> I think um, also, I mean, Florian, if if you mm, want to, please. I think, that too, um, I think this goes well with your point about not the self, but just that po poetic language. You know, you talked about poets having critical ears, right? And that there, there's something about poetry and the sort of attention to to language at such a granular level, maybe that is um different than something like a novel which is you know much longer and i don't know i i don't know if there is a relation there but just curious that's a really good question i don't know if i have, if i have a good immediate answer um the two i guess short things that come to mind is definitely in the barryman poem the dispossessed there's a reflection on on narratives, right? So how the way that we talk about the emblem, for example, is not just reliant on, you know, images, cliches in that way, but also cliche narratives, right? Of, you know, military heroism and, you know, protection and all that. So in that poem, there's definitely a reflection on narrative, right? Which I guess is perhaps sometimes um, poetry is more amenable to that potentially, um, to think about narrative more critically and at a distance because it's not, you know, doing narrative really. Um, and then in the other two poems, that's a really good question. There's definitely, I think the, the, the lyric speaker in Emmanuel's poem is definitely almost self parodic, right? And the way that she's describing herself as an observer of this test, of this nuclear test, she's sort of poking fun of her sort of awkward place, right? She's observing at a distance, this terrible destruction, and sort of the only imagery she can fall back on to is imagery that is sort of either natural or domestic, right? So there's a way in which that poem is definitely giving us a lyric speaker who is not in, a, in an authoritative position, right, to speak about the bomb fully responsibly. Is that answering your question? I'm not sure if it is. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I, I think Nicole, I have, are um, we good? Oh, good. Yuki, ready? Oh, I just, Nicole, yeah. are we good? We have a few minutes yet? Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I, I often yeah, think about the good difference between poetry and fiction, partly because I also write poetry. And I think one the like biggest difference is that um, in poetry, the lyric speaker never dies. He always, or she or he, she always gets the final words, you know, the last words. Um, but in, in a novel, you know, character just dies <laughs> all the time. And I think that's like biggest, one of the biggest differences. And I think partly that, that's why poetry is a kind of good for preserving yourself, you know, preserving the memory of the individual. Um, and what I was interested in, um, Merrill, is how he kind of gives up on that kind of function, one of the functions of poetry, which is to to you know announce himself in, in, in his final moment and um and and also I often think that in poetry when the poet says he or she dies that's always rhetorical like um, you know shelley in, in I, I forget which point but like i fall upon the thorns of life i bleed but he's not really bleeding you <laughs> know he's a kind of it's all rhetorical but in when the character bleeds in, in fiction it's real so i think that's somehow like self often persists in poetry and did it answer your question <laughs> yes that's fascinating i'll be i'll be mulling that over that's really interesting thank you thank you for that great question i have a question for baron if we've got a little time left i really appreciate what you're doing with the this african writer and situating him in his um moment and looking that great stuff you were saying about, you know, casting into the future and speaking retrospectively about a way of life that's already dying away or completely gone. And the whole time you were speaking, I was thinking about Things Fall Apart, which also has this great kind of before and after quality. And I wondered if you had also thought about that novel with respect to your theory about how the the yardsticks don't line up or there's just this kind of bad translation from old to new. Do you have any scenes from that novel that you have also kind of thought about along your, your really interesting argument? I mean, that's written all over that novel. I love the moment in that novel where he, he, they're describing the, the bike, you know, and it's like, it's like a 
mechanical horse and there's like a long description of that. I think that the, those moments of kind of encounter and confrontation, I think are really, I mean, they're so, they're so typical of African literature and in a way it's writing back against the longer European tradition of like Mungo Park and stuff like that, where it's all about like these very like, you know, going into the dark continent and encountering these strange things where you actually see how strange these things look. And that's all over Tutuola. I mean, there's, uh, I'll just say briefly, one of the, my favorite episodes I didn't get to talk about is where a uh, character who's described as a perfect gentleman goes into the fort, kind of guides him into the forest. And as he goes to each place, he's kind of selling off various body parts and stuff like that. So, um, you know, so I think that like, I think African literature is kind of, it, it, as it's been constructed kind of within global discourse is very much about confrontation with kind of the West and kind of trying to deal with this. And I think that's also kind of what people don't like about Tutuola is that it's not, or like within with the, the African readers don't like about Tutuola is it's not, it is too focused on kind of these encounters with the West or it's too amenable to being translated to the West. Mm. Um, yeah. And I think that's a, you know, kind of who is this literature for is such a major question in post colonial discourse in general. Um, but uh, it's, you know, I, I, I mean, what I'm really interested in, I think in my research, I'll say is just kind of looking at these networks as material networks and as networks of like trade and that they need to be looked at against these other networks which are kind of forming because I love, I read, I read so much, you know, literature from Nigeria and all these other places. And I'm aware of this at the same time that like the gas I'm filling up my car with is probably like, you know, tied up in also like these other much more dirty economies that tie me with these other spaces. So I think it's important that we think about these economies next to each other. Great, very helpful. I know we're out of time. Do we need to wrap up, Nicole? I think we should. We can go ahead and stop the recording in just a moment um, and we'll see all of our viewers at the next panel. So thank you, everyone. Um, I'll stop the recording and then we can. Great papers. <laughs> yeah. Really wonderful. Thank you all so much.